today's notes are going to cover the various revolutions in Latin America and the European and United States responses to those revolutions. As always, you can run this video through as many times as you like, and you can also pause it at any point. So the first revolution we need to talk about is the revolution that happens on um, the island of St. Domingue, which is going to transform part of that island into the country of Haiti. Now, St. Domingue was a French colony that had a very large slave population. I think it was something along the lines of 90% of the people who lived in St. Domingue were slaves. And so that leads to a lot of trouble, particularly with the taxation system that the French Revolution had just been raising up against and that sort of thing. And so it becomes led by a man named Toussaint Louverture. And Louverture was a former slave who had been freed and who was living on the island as a free man of color, but because of that he didn't have a whole lot of rights. And he leads a revolt against the French military. And then there are various other series of rebellions that happen. This takes a long time. And so ultimately they defeat not just France, but also Spanish soldiers and British soldiers who had banded together to help the, Haitian, the French against their slave rebellion. Haiti becomes the first Latin American territory to gain its freedom. It's actually not just that. It's the first American territory, American area, outside of the United States to gain its freedom from Europe. And it is renamed Haiti, which was a native word for mountainous land. So moving on, there are several countries in South America that all received their freedoms from Europe at approximately the same time, most of which are going to be led by a man named Simon Bolivar. Bolivar was a Creole, so if you think back to in our notes about Latin American culture, we had like the triangular system where at the top were the peninsulares, the people who were born in Europe. And then the next step is where the Creoles were. And the Creoles were the native-born Spaniards. So they were born to essentially white parents from Spain, but they were born in Latin America. They were born in South America or Mexico or wherever. P Bolivar had gone to university and studied the ideas of the Enlightenment. People like Locke and Montesquieu and Rousseau who had spoke out about freedom and the right to rule yourself and governmental protection and that sort of thing. And so he leads independence movements in northern South America. Now if I make this a little bigger, let me bring it to the front. Oh, reorder. Sorry. And make it a little bigger, you can see that he had traveled throughout and brought in some information. I'm going to pause the video for just a second and bring up this map and give you a little more animation about it. So, when Bolivar studied, he took the ideas of Locke and Paine and Voltaire and Montesquieu and Rousseau and brought them back to South America. He also went to Europe and had studied our governmental system under you know, Jefferson and Franklin and Madison and the founding fathers of the United States. And so then he went to London and he hoped that the British would side with him in helping to free the Spanish colonies. That didn't necessarily work for him, but at least he tried. So the third person, third area you need to know about for this unit is the country of Mexico. Mexico had a similar colonial experience to that of the rest of the Spanish colonies, so it's much more similar to what happened in South America as to what would have happened in Haiti. But it was initially led by a man named Father Miguel Hidalgo, 
who was a Catholic priest who was speaking out against the mistreatment of the native populations and that sort of thing in Mexico. And he leads a result of the lower levels of society. So remember that the mestizos we talked about are the mixed populations of one parent was a white person from Spain and one person was a native, native Mexican. And so he leads this group of about 80,000 people and it was a fairly intense battle. I mean, that's a massive amount of soldiers and people to be rebelling. Um, and actually, Hidalgo is killed in this revolt. And he's replaced by a man named Jose Maria Morales, who is also defeated. And Jose Maria Morales was a well-known Creole, a well-known Spaniard born in Mexico. And so his social group, the Creoles, react very strongly against his destruction. And so they, it actually launches, their, their defeats are launching the major Mexican revolution from Spain. So, if you give me just a second to pull this one up. The British, by the 1800s, this is an 1800s map, had British Honduras and the island of Jamaica as their only colonial holdings in the Western Hemisphere. Now remember, they would have had Canada, which doesn't show up on this map, and they also would have had a lot of Eastern Hemisphere colonies like India. The Dutch, the Netherlands, had Dutch Guiana. The French had French Guiana and also St. Domingo, Haiti, which is right here. The Portuguese had Brazil, as we've talked about, and then the Spanish had everything in green. Like, if I clear out all these others, everything that's bright, bright green is what the Spanish controlled. I mean, that's a massive amount of territory in 1800. Now, when I swap to 1830, there, there is nothing else, because the only thing that's a colony are these red areas. Everything else, all of this purple, becomes independent countries. Spain lost massive amounts of territory. So Jose de San Martin is going to lead a southern route. We don't particularly need to cover him very much. And then Bolivar, the one we definitely need to know, he liberates northern South America and joins with San Martin to liberate Peru. So everybody always says, why don't we ever talk about the United States? Well, we're going to talk about the United States. <laughs> not necessarily in a positive light. The United States gained its independence from Britain, which of course was then a launch point for the French Revolution and for these revolutions in Latin America. Now, we've been a country for all of, say, 50 years at this point, which is a blink of an eye in country's length of time. But we basically decided under President James Monroe that these new colonies, these new countries that were former Spanish and French land holdings and Portuguese land holdings could be really good allies for us in our part of the world because of our proximity to them and our similar resources. So James Monroe issues what's called the Monroe Doctrine. And according to the Monroe Doctrine, there are two parts. One, President James Monroe acknowledged that Latin American countries that had rebelled and won their revolutions were considered independent nations, so essentially we're giving them legitimacy. We are giving them the okay that yes, these are countries on the world stage. But we went a step further. We also said that any European country, most notably Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, the countries who'd lost these colonies, any attempts by those countries to take over these independent nations. So basically, if Spain wanted to come back and take over Mexico, or if Portugal wanted to come back and try and recontrol Brazil, we would see those attacks and those invasions as direct threats on the United States and our own safety, and we would ally with these new nations to fight off these European nations. So essentially, if Europe came and attacked a colony in Mexico, in Latin America or in the Western Hemisphere in general, we would go back against them and fight with them against Europe. 
So here's a really famous political cartoon that demonstrates exactly what I'm saying. It's it's Uncle Sam, obviously, issuing the Monroe Doctrine here in South America. It says Monroe Doctrine. And we've split, this particular person has split the two hemispheres in half, right? Where we have the Western Hemisphere here, where Uncle Sam is protecting it. And there's all these European countries sitting back across the Atlantic Ocean just watching. And if basically, if these guys had guns and were coming across, then Uncle Sam would, would kick them out. So on the bottom of your notes, it says to draw an if-then political cartoon. So this is sort of what I have pictured. You have, you're going to have two sides to your political cartoon, and you're going to have an if side and a then side. And you're doing the Monroe Doctrine. So according to the Monroe Doctrine, if such and such happens, then something else will happen. So that's what you're drawing into the bottom of your notes. If you have any questions, please let me know.